Okay, hello and welcome to Principles of Accounting 1. Happy to have uh, all of you with us, or especially Noreen, so thank you for joining us um, uh, in this very unique uh, session today. Um, I am uh, I'm broadcasting to you from Medellin, Colombia in South America. Uh, today, we're, we're going to be talking about accounting for corporations because that is uh, where we are in the classroom in week 13. In looking at the classroom, just as kind of a recap, uh, we're getting closer to the end of this course. Right now, we are in week 13. And um, for, so for this week, we have a discussion board, which I see some of you are already very active in. Uh, as a reminder, when it comes to the discussion boards and the um, hypothesis, those both are required. So, so it's super important that um, that you do both of those things whenever they show up, or you know, if one of them shows up or the other, whatever. Just make sure you do them because you don't want to skip anything in this course. Because if you skip around or if you decide you don't want to do something because you don't like it, like a discussion, like I don't like discussion boards a whole lot either. You know what I mean? But I strongly recommend that you that you complete both the discussion boards and the hypothesis because the reality is if you don't complete all the work in this course, it'll be very difficult for you to pass. Um, if you looked at the, the syllabus uh, and you and you you know, you know how to do a little bit of math. You can see when, you know, back in the start here, when you look at the syllabus, the syllabus tells us uh, the point breakdown. And when you look at the syllabus and you go to the point breakdown here, we see that discussion boards are worth 70, per, 70 points and hypothesis are worth 40. So if you just decide that you don't want to do hypothesis or discussion boards, the highest grade you could possibly earn if you got everything correct, like all the quizzes, LinkedIn learning, midterm and final, if you nail all those things, the highest grade you could get is a B. So don't do that to yourself. Make sure that you're doing both uh, hypothesis and discussion boards. Most of you are pretty good about it, but you know I have to say it for a reason because some of you aren't doing those. And uh, you know I just don't wanna see you uh, hurt yourself by not doing them. So, okay. Uh, Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's discussion on accounting for corporations. This is kind of a really important conversation. I don't know why it's doing that a lot. This is kind of a really important conversation uh, because uh, it's somewhat difficult when we talk about stock. A lot of students don't quite understand how things like dividends, common stock, and preferred stock work. And uh, I just want to kind of break it down for you in a really simplistic way. So that way you can you can have really basic understanding. I'm not going to give you any kind of advice about stock, but I will um, tell you how, how and why it's done in, in companies. So that way you have a really good understanding. So first, when we talk about stock, it's important to understand the formation of the company and, and how it was created because this tells us how many shares of stock are going to be available uh, and, and ultimately what the um, guiding principles of the, of the company look like. So for example, if, if, if Noreen and I, we start a business together, uh, we, can, we can decide what percentage of ownership we each have. So let's say Noreen comes into this new business with me she brings, a, uh, we'll say, uh, equipment, some equipment, uh, maybe a vehicle and, um, and $25,000 in cash. So equipment, vehicle, 25000 in cash. We figure out how much the vehicle is worth, how much the equipment is worth. And that will be Noreen's portion uh, of ownership in the company so far. And then Dr. B, I'm going to bring in, we'll say, hundred thousand dollars in cash okay so so now we gotta figure out um, what is the percent ownership of each person okay who owns what in the business that dictates uh, 
what percentage of ownership you have in the company. So, so if you ever go into business with someone else and you want to figure out what is your percent ownership, this is the way to do it. So we, we, we look at what each person is bringing into the business uh, and we use a percent based on a percentage of 100 percent. We figure out percentage of what everything is worth, what the value is that each person is bringing into the business. This also includes liabilities like loans and, and uh, uh, any other type of liabilities. And that what that will ultimately do is it will reduce the owner's equity. So once we figure out the percentage of ownership for each person, we can then figure out the, the entity itself. So if it's a partnership, uh, LLC, S Corp, C Corp, this kind of tells us um, the percentage of, that each owner has. It's also important to understand that based off of the formation of the company, the company itself might have rights and privileges. What we mean by that is with an uh, S corporation or a C corporation, the company itself is kind of identified as a person, although it's you know obviously not, it's a business, it's not a person, but the, the, the business itself has rights and privileges, which is kind of nice because Oftentimes with a C Corp or an S Corp, it, it gives us that limited liability. So we can only be sued up to the company's value, basically, uh, is what that means. All of this to say uh, the business can be identified as either being privately held or publicly held. A privately held business is like a local business, okay? A local business is privately held. What that means is that it's owned by maybe one or more peoples uh, that that work in the business, that um, have stake in the business. And it, uh, so that's what it means to be privately held. Publicly held companies, those are publicly traded companies. So a publicly held company would be like Starbucks, uh, would be like Macy's, would be like uh, other companies that are publicly traded. Okay, so like they, they buy and sell shares of stock on the open exchanges. So that's the, the primary difference between the two. Both types of ownership have shares of stock in the business. And we'll, we'll talk more about this. So when it comes to the characteristics of the companies, the corporations, they have some advantages and disadvantages of, of each type of setup. The advantages of a corporation like a C Corp or an S Corp is that the, co the company itself is identified as a separate legal entity. What this means is that the individuals of the company are probably not going to be sued if there's, a, if there's a lawsuit. The company will. And so what that does is it protects the ownership. It protects the owners. And therefore, it has what we call limited liability. What that means is that the company can be sued up to the value of the company, not necessarily the individual owners. So if you have a C corporation and there are only two owners in the company, the two owners are protected. The company itself is at risk. So that's an advantage to the owners, right? Ownership is also transferable in this situation. What this means is that we can buy and sell shares of stock in the company, uh, which means that it's transferable. If you own a share of stock in a company, that means you are an owner of that company. And you have the right to buy and sell sh your shares of stock. It is transferable, as they say. The other advantage to this type of corp C Corp or S Corp is that they have what's called continuous life. Meaning, once the founders of the company pass away or they decide they don't want to be in business anymore, the company lives on, right? The company marches forward. It, 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 for example, Macy's. Uh, Macy's, one of my favorite retailers in the United States, has been around for a really long time. They've been around since the late 1800s, Okay. Uh, another example, Levi Jeans. They've been around uh, since the mid 1800s. Of course, the owners, uh, the original owners, are no longer around. In fact, most of their families are no longer around either. So, in this case, the business has 
continuous life. It will never, the business will never end unless it goes out of business, it goes bankrupt. A uh, classic example of that would be Sears. It had continuous life up until the point where it went bankrupt. There is no mutual agency for the stockholders, which, which essentially means that no one stockholder can, can um, act as the company, right? No mutual agency. And it's easier for companies to raise capital, to raise money uh, by, by selling more shares of stock. Now, that's, that's probably the, one of the easiest ways that a company can raise funds is to sell shares of stock. Of course, the disadvantages of this are government regulation and, of course, the dreaded taxes. Those are, those are the advantages and disadvantages of a corporation. Now, some people look at this organizational chart and they think, well, Dr. B, there's no way. This, I mean, this doesn't look right to me. Because typically in a, in a maybe a private business, the CEO is at the top. And then you have the presidents, vice presidents, uh, directors, whatever. And then you have the employees. That's in a private business. In a public business or, or in a C corp or S corp that's privately held, the structure looks more like this. The stockholders are at the top of the company. The reason for this is because the stockholders vote for each share of stock that they have. They vote. It's kind of like a democracy. With a democracy, you have the right to vote. The same exists in a corporation. The shareholders vote on the board of director positions. This, this means that the, the shareholders have the ultimate authority. The shareholders can say, oh, uh, this controller or this, um, you know, uh, these people that sit on the board, if we don't like them, we can have them removed by voting them out of office. The board of directors are the ones that set forth the corporate governance, the policies, the way things are supposed to be done. Board of directors do that. And who answers to the board of directors? It's the CEO, the C. IO, CAO, C, CCO, whatever the list goes on, right? All of the um, important presidential positions. And then you have the vice presidents and then the other officers. They report to the board of directors. Board of directors sets the governance. The governance is governed by the sh shareholders, right? And then the employees of the company, they report to the executive level. This is a very typical type of structure for, for a corporate uh, entity. Uh, and it's the best one. And the reason why it's the best one is because it is a form of democracy that, that actually works pretty well uh, because the, the, the shareholders have the right to vote. So it's, it's overall a great structure. Shareholders vote uh, at, 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 at stockholder meetings. Um, or through what we call um, uh, special meeting. So just for example, uh, just um, a few weeks ago, I received some mail, and it was from a couple of companies that I have sh uh, shares of stock in. And I'm thinking, what you know, what do they want? Maybe maybe they're just giving me something, or whatever. I was excited because I thought maybe I was getting a dividend, but that wasn't the case. It was for me to do some voting. So, okay. So, so I logged in and I did my voting and it was for diff different corporate structural changes that the companies that I have shares of stock and wanted to make. So I thought that was kind of cool, but that's one of the rights of the shareholder. We could also sell or dispose of stock, purchase proportional or additional shares of stock. So buying and selling shares of stock, that's one of the rights. Receiving dividends, if any. Not all companies pay dividends. A dividend is kind of like, um, think of it like a form of interest that they're paying to the shareholders as a mm, thank you for owning shares of stock in the company. That's a nice way of thinking about it. Not all companies pay them. 
In fact, very few do these days. The reason why companies pay dividends in the first place, or the real reason, is because they it's a way for them to attract new shareholders. That's that's the real reason. And a fifth is to share any assets remaining after creditors preferred stock are paid in liquidation. What this simply means is that when the company goes out of business, if there's anything left over after the creditors and preferred shareholders get their get their parts, then the uh, common shareholders can might get a, a piece. So th this happened to me before. I, I used to own shares of stock in in, um, in Sears. And then when Sears went out of business, uh, what the, it worked just like this. But uh, but the thing is, they didn't have anything left over uh, after their liquidation. So um, I didn't get anything. <laughs> this is what a share of stock looks like. It, the reason why they call it stock is because it was oftentimes printed on stock board, like a really thick um, piece of paper, stock board. Yep, that's what that was the name of the piece of paper. They, of, of course, these days it's all digital, so they don't actually send these anymore. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they do. It depends on the company, but most of the time it's all digital now. So uh, it'll just show up with a serial number uh, on a list of a piece of paper. But uh, but that's this is kind of what it looks like, right? It's got the company name and a little bit of details, the serial number of the share of stock, and then usually the amount. So when the company looks to authorize stock, what this means is that the company is deciding how many shares of stock we want to sell. And when we, when we do this, we do it based off of the, the guiding document, which is also known as the, um, what's the name? It, it's the... It's a set of principles that the that the company operates by. It is the um, uh, it's like the company constitution, basically. And what it does is it is it says, "Hey, this is the number of shares of stock that we're going to allow to be issued." It's like the maximum amount. And when the company is ready, they'll authorize a certain amount of shares to sell. They'll say, okay, we have 100 million shares based off of our governing document. And based on that 100 million shares, we'll authorize 2 million shares to be sold on this particular day. Okay, that's what authorization means. And they authorize that at an, a certain amount assigned per share. We call this par value stock par value stock oftentimes the par value of a share of stock um, is is what we call this uh at a stated value and we'll talk about that here briefly non-par value stock is where there's no assigned amount per share non-par value is oftentimes um listed and, and provided to um, sometimes preferred shareholders or employees of the company. Uh, it's basically um, arbitrary value assigned. That's what non-par value of stock is. And then the third type of valuation is called the stated value stock. This is non-par stock that has assigned or stated value per share. Fancy way of saying we need to be able to account for each share of stock, and so we will assign a value to it. Off what the what usually if you look at a uh, stated value of stock uh, in in a company's financial statements, it'll say something like 0 0.001 penny. 0 0.001 cent. That's the stated value of stock. It's it's basically a way of giving it value, although it's really not worth much, right? So we'll, we'll talk more about this as we go through some examples. When you look at your balance sheet on the under equity, you see this one that says stockholders equity. And usually it consists of two different things. 
what we call paid in capital and retained earnings. Paid in capital, this, or, uh, this is the amount that the owners have um, given into the company. Paid in capital. It's what the owners provided to the company. So, for example, though I gave you an earlier example. Noreen and I, we started this business, uh, uh, and Noreen brought in some equipment, a vehicle, and 25000 in cash. And so that would be Noreen's paid in capital. It would be the value of the, the vehicle, the 25000 in cash, plus the value of the equipment. That would be Noreen's paid in capital. For me, I brought in $100,000 in cash, so that would be my paid in capital. You see? And the other part is the retained earnings. Retained earnings is a cumulative net income, and it's not distributed as dividends to the to the stockholders. It's retained. The word retained means to keep. So we're keeping this amount in the business. Okay, it's uh, at the end of the year when you look at your income statement, you're, you'll have your you know your your sales minus your cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus all your expenses minus your taxes paid ex, uh, interest expense etc. At the very end, we have net income. Net income. If it's kept in the company, meaning it's not distributed to the owners, we call it retained earnings. It gets transferred to the statement of retained earnings. It gets closed out. Remember, we talked about the closing entries a long time ago. That I think it was like back in week three or four. We talked about uh, uh, how we close out our temporary accounts. Net income gets closed out to, re to retained earnings. It ends up on the statement of retained earnings. Therefore, it ends up on our owner's equity. You see, stockholder's equity. So those are the parts of it. This is a really important thing to know when it comes to stock. Par value is an arbitrary amount assigned to each share of stock when it's authorized. That's what I had said. When we, when we authorize each share of stock, it's like 0 0.001 penny for each share of stock. It's a way of giving it value, okay? It is never the same as the market price. Market price is the amount that it's currently being exchanged for on the open market. So, for example, you go on to the NASDAQ or, um, the S or you go into S&P or you go into uh, New York Stock Exchange, and you look at the market price of each share of stock. That's that price that you see. That's the market price. That's what's currently being uh, sold for. So par value is never the same as market price. Very different things. So we classify. At, earlier, I had mentioned we classify stock in three different ways. Uh, we have par value, non-par value, and the stated value. So when it comes to the shareholders' equity, which, uh, as you know, is a, is a part of your balance sheet un, under equity, it has the, the paid in capital and the retained earnings like we talked about. They roll up they, the, uh, um, into equity. So, so uh, how does it look on, on, the, on the balance sheet? It's important to understand that both common stock, paid in capital, and retained earnings normally hold a credit balance. So when you look at the expanded accounting equation, assets equals liabilities plus equity, within equity, you know you have um, sales or revenue minus expenses plus, um, plus uh, what, what did we say? Oh, plus uh, owner's withdrawals minus all that other stuff, that's where this is built into. Yeah, so that's important to know that. So there's a couple of journal entries that we make oftentimes when, when we start to issue stock. Uh, and this is an example of, of, of one of them. So here we have on June 5th, uh, our snowboard company issued 30,000 shares of common stock at $10 par value for $300,000. 
So what, basically what we're saying is that we're going to start the valuation of, of each share of stock at $10. Remember that uh, when we when we say par value, it's an arbitrary amount. Okay, it's an amount that we that we assign to it. So in this case, ten dollars per share, thirty thousand shares, ten times thirty thousand, of course, is three hundred thousand. So we record this uh, at the time that we've issued or sold the, our shares of stock. So typically, when we issue, that means we're selling, right? So here we have June 5th, we sold uh, 30,000 shares of stock at $10 a piece, common stock. So we debit cash 300,000 because we're receiving cash from our shareholders, 300,000, because they essentially bought the 30,000 shares of stock that we issued. So debit cash 300,000, credit common stock 300,000. So that's the first journal entry type of journal entry we make when we issue shares of stock. Now, uh, sometimes we might sell our shares of stock above the par value. We call this at a premium, at a premium. When you sell something above its value, you're selling it at a premium. And okay, that's what that term premium means. So let's say instead of selling it at par value, we're going to sell it at a premium. Okay. So uh, we got to figure out what is the, the premium? What's the premium worth? So we, we know that the par value of each share of stock is $10 per share. And we're issuing 30,000 shares. So we know that our common stock par value is going to be 300,000. We're going to sell each share of stock for $12 per share. That is $2 above par value. So if you say $12 per share sale price minus the par value of $10, that means that we are selling each share of stock at a $2 premium. Okay, so in order for us to calculate the premium value, we take the difference, in this case, $2, 12 minus the 10, sale price minus par value. That's $2 times the 30,000 shares of stock that were sold or issued will give us $60,000 in excess of par. Okay, also known as the premium amount. So this means that we will be collecting $360,000 in cash. So we debit 360, uh, we credit common stock 300, and we credit paid in capital in excess 60,000. See how that works? But that's, that's essentially the formula when you wanna calculate uh, paid in capital in excess. We take the sale price or issue in price minus the par value times the number of shares of stock. Do this subtraction first, yeah, order of operation. So when we report this, this is what the report would show. Uh, and this one's going to show up on your statement of retained earnings. The statement of retained earnings, as you know, shows changes in ownership, okay? It's gonna show things like um, net income. It'll show things like owner's withdrawals. It'll show things like um, owner's contributions. It'll also show changes in stock. So in this case, uh, our, our uh, statement of retained earnings will look like this. We'll have common stock issuance, 300,000 par value, plus the paid in capital uh, in excess, right? Because we sold it uh, at a premium, 60,000 in this case. We had retained earnings from our income statement of 65,000, which gives us, we had all those together to get a total of stockholders equity, 425,000.
So we talked about par value. Let's talk about non-par value. That should say non-par, not no par. Non-par value. So non-par value stock. Here we have the example. Uh, October 20, our company issued 1,000 shares of non-par value stock for $40 per share. Okay. Again, a common practice for non-par value, we usually issue something like this to share to our employees. Yeah. Some companies give a benefit uh, in your benefits. Um, you, your company might, might give you shares of stock. It's usually non-par value stock. So here we have the example. A uh, company issued 1,000 shares at $40 per share, non-par value. So this is a really simple uh, journal entry. We debit cash, 40000 credit common stock, 40000 uh, non-par value. Very, very simple. Now, sometimes a company will also issue the non-par value at a premium, at a premium or above its stated value, okay? So uh, in this case, we have the non-par value stock, 1,000 shares, $40 per share. We already know that that's $40,000. we are going to distribute, sell the shares of stock to our employees for $50 per share. Okay, no problem. So what that means is that we're going to also credit paid in capital in excess or the premium, 10,000. Why 10,000? Because it's the, remember, it's the difference. So we take the, the issue and price, how much we're selling it for, minus the stated value. In this case, that's $10 per share times the 1,000 shares, right? So we're going to debit cash 50,000. Credit common stock for uh, stated value forty thousand, non par, and paid in excess ten thousand. Another example, uh, but this one is a slightly different. So um, the the example I gave before that would be like when an employee is purchasing shares of stock from the company that they work for, as example. As I had also mentioned, sometimes a company might give the shares of stock to the employees without, um, without cash. Okay. Or another example of this would be we are um, going to purchase a piece of land in exchange for shares of stock in the company. I've seen this happen before where um, you can think of this as like a exchange without cash. Okay. So uh, for example, Coca-Cola was looking to expand their, their facility in, um, I think it's in Landover. Anyway, it's somewhere in Maryland, um, heading toward the, the shore. South of Baltimore, heading toward the shore, uh, the eastern shore. Coca-Cola has, has a uh, bottling facility there, and they wanted to expand uh, the facility. In order to do this, they would need to purchase the land from the neighbor. The neighbor was unwilling to sell the land. Uh, at a certain price. And so the company came back to the neighbor and said, hey, listen, instead of um, us giving you cash, what if we, we gave you stock in the company? And the landowner agreed to this uh, type of deal. So that really happened. That's a, that's a real example. Um, it, so why, you're probably wondering, why would somebody do that instead of just taking the cash, right? Oh, if it were Dr. B, I would have taken the cash. That maybe depends on my, what my needs are. But think about this for a second. What happens to the value of the stock over time? It might go up. In fact, it probably will. So if you're a gambling person and you think that the stock is going to go up in this company over time, you might opt for getting the shares of stock instead of the, the cash up front. So that's just an example of this. 
So here we have that type of example. So Coca-Cola buy, buying the neighbor's land for shares of stock instead of, uh, instead of cash. The land is valued at 105,000. In exchange for this land valued at 105,000, the company decided to issue 4,000 4, shares of stock to the neighbor at $20 per share, our value. Okay, so great. So here's how we would calculate this. We would, the Coca-Cola would debit land 105,000, credit the common stock 80,000. Why 80,000? 4,000 shares times 20. Uh, but you'll also notice that that's not, that's not quite uh, uh, there, right? So, so we got the 4,000 shares at 20, right? We got that, no problem. That's the, that's the par value. But we know that we paid more than that, or the value of the land is more than that, right? Because 80,000 is not the same as 105. So there's a difference of 25,000. 105 times 80 is 25,000. So that difference is paid in capital in excess of par. We're giving more value for the stock to the landowner in exchange for the land. See how that works? Uh, here we have uh, another example where uh, we have we have some owners who needed to raise some cash, but they you know they didn't quite need the cash, but they needed it to pay for some expenses. Uh, so here example, um, attorney. Oh, this is one of my favorite ones. Attorney's expenses. So, so we needed a lawyer for the company to do some very small work. This is real life example. Needed a lawyer for the company to do some real small work. It was just like filings, and, you know, basic, real basic stuff. But I didn't want to pay the lawyer cash because at the time our company was pretty cash strapped. We just didn't have the cash up front. So we worked a deal with the lawyer. I said, okay, attorney, here's a, here's a thing. Uh, I'll be I'll be happy to pay you, but um, I don't have the cash. So I, I said, how about this attorney? Uh, I'll give you shares of stock in my company in exchange for your services. Attorney agreed. So. This is just another way for the company to be able to pay for expenses without having to pay cash. It's an exchange. So here we go uh, with this example. Company gave 600 shares of stock at $15 per share for $12,000 worth of work. Okay, so we're going to debit the expense $12,000. Let's use my lawyer expense, right? I would debit legal fees, legal expenses, 12000 And then I would credit common stock at $15 par value for 9000 Why 9000 15 times 600 shares. 15 times 600, 9000 So, but that's obviously not equal to 12. There's a difference here of three. So 12,000 minus the nine is 3,000. 3,000 is in excess. It's above the par value. You see that how that works? I'll tell you, in business, you're not always going to have cash up front to be able to pay for some of these expenses, right? So you got to think about that. You got to think about um, how are you going to how are you going to make this work? So this is this is one way of doing it. Ultimately. The lawyer benefited more than the $12,000. Why? Because the value of the stock went up over time. So the attorney made out even better this way, you see. Something to think about for those of you who are uh, trying to figure out how to pay for stuff in, in business without having to pay uh, cash. 
So, um, so we talked about common stock. We talked about recording things like par value, non-par value. Um, I was talking about exchanges and all that cool stuff. So now I want to talk to you a little bit deeper uh, about recording other things like when cash is involved, when we're paying cash dividends, stock dividends, and stock splits. And I'll give you some examples uh, of each as we roll through. So cash dividends, these are nice. Um, this is a great way for a company to attract new investors. That's really the primary reason why a company pays out a cash dividend. It always has an effect on the stock's market value. It's a fancy way for saying if the company issues a dividend, it's going to attract new investors. And when you have new investors, the value of the stock goes up. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. When a company has the ability to pay a cash dividend, it must have sufficient balance and retained earnings and the cash necessary to pay the dividend. You'd think that that was common sense, okay? Oh, I got to make sure I have enough retained earnings. Yeah. I got to make sure I have enough cash to pay them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't make promises to pay if you don't have the money, right? So that, that's kind of how that works. So what happens when a cash dividend is declared? A couple of things need to happen. There's, so there's three important dates that we record. The first is the date of the declaration. This is basically when the board of directors said, hey, listen, um, we have enough in retained earnings and cash to pay a dividend. Let's do it. Let's pay some, some of our uh, shareholders. Great. We call it the date of declaration. In this, we record the liability for the dividend. So uh, for the, the recordation would look like this. It would be, we would, uh, we would debit dividend expense and credit dividends payable. Credit dividend expense. I'm sorry, debit, dividend expense, and credit, dividend payable. Remember, the word payable means liability. So that'd be the type of transaction we would record at the date of the declaration. The next date that has some importance is called the date of record. This is when we decided to um, finalize uh, the decision to issue the, the dividend date of record. And the third most important date is the date of the payment. This is when we actually pay our, our shareholders. So the, the transaction that we would make on that date, the date of payment, would, we would debit dividends payable and credit cash. Right? So we're actually paying at that time. Oh, great. Here's some examples. I forgot that these were on the next slide. So this is this is kind of similar to what I was was, was mentioning. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I, I said dividend expense. I, I meant retained earnings. My bad. So I apologize for that. Um, January 9, the company decided to issue $1 cash dividend per share of stock, 5,000 shares. Okay. So that's $5,000 that we're going to pay out. So the day that we declared, we would debit retained earnings and credit common dividend payable, dividend payable. The next date, there's no date, uh, there's no entry required. It's just a date of record. It's basically saying this is uh, the board of directors are authorizing the payment uh, on this date. That's what date of record means. And then we actually pay the shareholders. So we would debit common dividend payable, 5000 and credit cash, 5000 Those are the types of transactions we would make. So when we pay dividends, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a way of attracting new shareholders. That's, that's the reality of why, why dividends are paid out. 
the cash dividend. The other thing that a company does to attract new shareholders is issue what's called a stock dividend. Basically what this is, is instead of paying out cash to our shareholders through a uh, cash dividend, we'll just give them more shares of stock. That's pretty much it. We're giving the shareholders more shares of stock rather than giving them cash. That's what a stock dividend is. So it's a way of maintaining our cash. It does have an effect on the market price. Slightly it improves the market price. And it also shows that management has confidence in the company. Real simple. If there's a small stock dividend, that means that the distribution is less than 25% of previously outstanding shares. Basically, what that means is that the distribution of the shares of stock are going to be less than 25%. If it's a large stock dividend, it's going to be greater than 25%. Okay, so, so here we have an example of a small stock dividend. Uh, this example, we're issuing uh, 10,000 shares at $10 our value. Uh, and it was declared at 10%. At 10%. So... In order for us to figure out how much this is going to be, we take the number of shares, in this case 10,000, we multiply that by 10% to get 1,000 shares. We multiply that 1,000 shares by $15 per share, which is the uh, current sales price of each share of stock, giving us a value of fifteen thousand dollars of uh, it, uh, of stock, but in this case we're not issuing the fifteen thousand. That's going to be our retained earnings. We're actually only issuing uh, at its par value plus the in excess, if that makes sense. So we debit retained earnings fifteen thousand. We credit common dividend distributable 10,000. That's the thousand uh, shares at $10 par value. Because remember, we're, we're only actually issuing the, the thousand shares, not, not the full 10. Uh, and so there's obviously a difference of 15,000 here. The difference comes into the paid in excess. So it works very, very similar to, to the other to the other methods. So um, the only real difference here is that we're issuing at a percentage, a percentage. So uh, so yeah, that would be that would be the transaction we recorded, and then this is the effect uh, that it would have uh, based off of the the entries. So before the dividend. Uh, and then what it looks like after. It just shows you the balances this, uh, on the um, statement of uh, uh, owner's equity or retained earnings. So uh, on, the, on the date of payment, it would look like this. We would record it like this. We would debit common stock dividend distributable or payable. And credit common stock shows shows the issuance of that common stock. If for a large stock dividend, it would work like this. Again, similar. It's just a larger percentage. If it's small, it's under twenty five percent. If it's greater than twenty five percent, it's considered large. So, uh, so here we have uh, issuance of 10,000 shares at $1 per par value. Let's see, we declared 30% 30, 30 dividend. So that what this means is we're going to issue it at 30%. 10,000 shares times the 30% means we're actually gonna issue 3,000 shares total at a 
par value of, it should be $10 par value. It says one up there. That, I'm pretty sure that's a typo. It should say 10, not one. $10 par value, which is 30,000. So order of operations, we're going to take care of the percentage first. Number of shares of stock times the percentage gives you total number of shares to be issued times par value equals the amount. So think order of operations here. In this case, we debit retained earnings 30,000, credit common stock dividend distributable 30,000. So we haven't issued it yet, but we're going to in the future. Now, when we actually issue it, uh, uh, it, uh, it'll flip like it did before. So, so we talked about issuance um, of, share, of uh, dividend shares. Now let's talk about this concept called stock splits. This happened to me before, and it's really easy to understand, um, but I'm, I'm going to explain it in a real simple way. So stock splits. Oftentimes, a company will split their shares of stock in order to create more shares. It makes sense. T think about like a, taking a, a whole piece, cut it in two. Now you have two pieces, but these two pieces are the same size. Okay, you think about like cutting something directly in half. Right through the middle. You used to have one piece, you cut it in half, now you have two of the same size. That's a stock split. Uh, this happened to me with Starbucks. Uh, when I had a bunch of Starbucks shares, uh, the company decided to, to issue a stock split. So at the time I had, we'll say, uh, 1,000 shares of stock. They issued a, shark, a stock split. Now all of a sudden I have 2,000 shares of stock. Okay. Now what happens is that the value of each share of stock is also split into two. So if it used to be worth $20 per share, it's now worth $10 per share. But you have double the amount of shares. You see a stock split. It's split in half. The price and the amount of shares doubles. Price is split in half, the amount of shares doubles. Stock split. You take a whole piece, cut it in the middle, it becomes two pieces. It's still the same. It just ha so happens to be cut in half, <laughs> you see? So if you look at this slide, $20 par value, 100,000 shares, becomes $10 par value, 200,000 shares. It's the same. It's the exact same thing. It just so happens to be a, a double the amount of shares at a lower value. But it's the same if you add it up, right? Now, you might be wondering, why do companies do this? Again, it's to attract new investors. And it's also to increase the opportunity for the company to increase the um, size of shareholders. So if if we if we compare the the four side by side cash dividend, small stock dividend, large stock dividend, and the stock splits, we can see the effects on the overall equity uh, as assets, liabilities, and equity accounts. With cash dividend, of course, the assets are going to go down because we're paying cash. Cash goes down, therefore your total assets go down, right? The, uh, when we pay cash dividend, the total equity also goes down. Why? Because now all of a sudden we have less uh, uh, in, in terms of the retained earnings, right? Because we paid out more from the retained earnings. When it comes to the small stock dividends, we see an increase in common stock and an increase in the paid in excess and a decrease in total retained earnings. So the only change affected when it comes to small and large stock dividends are in total equity. For the large stock dividend, the change is in common stock and in retained earnings. And with stock splits, there are no changes at all. 
the only the only change again is the uh, is really the amount of shares available. So uh, so we talked about common stock a lot. So the word common means commonly available. So anyone can go out to the open market and purchase a share of stock and you're going to receive a share of common stock. Preferred stock is a little bit more, uh, how do we say, uh, selective. It, preferred stock is usually reserved for um, uh, officers of the company, employees of the company, uh, and maybe a few select investors. It's, it's preferred, right, as the name implies. So, he, so here we have an example uh, issuance of preferred stock. Company issued 50 shares of $100 par value preferred stock in exchange for $6,000 in cash. So, company received $6,000 in cash, debit $6,000 in cash. We credit the preferred stock $100 par value. We always record par value separate from anything else, whether it's in excess or at a loss. We always record it separate. That's because of the accounting rules, remember? It's kind of like, the, it's the same reason why we never reduce the value of an asset when we depreciate it. You see what I'm saying? That we have to keep it at separate. So preferred stock on all par value, 50 shares, 5,000. Of course, the difference is going to be $1,000. The cash amount minus the preferred stock amount gives us a thousand dollars difference. In this case, we credit paid in capital in excess par value preferred stock thousand dollars. Very, it works very, very similar um, to, to common stock in this case. At the bottom of the slide here, we can see what the effect is on the statement of retain earnings, uh, or statement of stockholders equity, whatever you want to call it. Um, we see the changes uh, in, in, the, in the stock values. And we also see the retained earnings amount and the total stock close equity. So why, why do companies issue preferred stock, uh, again, to preferred investors, like, like officers of the company, employees, and maybe a couple of other investors? They do it to raise money without sacrificing control, right? I would sacrifice control if I sold it to the general public. But if I sell it to people within the company, I'm not sacrificing control, you see? It gives a boost to the, re, uh, to the re, uh, return within common stockholders through financial leverage. Fancy word for meaning, because when I issue the preferred stock, I'm raising cap, I'm raising cash, but I'm not sacrificing the control. I'm also giving a boost to the to the other stockholders at the same time because there's more people investing in the company, so to speak. And the third, of course, is to appeal to investors who might think that the common stock is too risky. That might be the expected return might be low. That's why I said like we usually issue it only to employees and officers of the company but we also might offer it to select investors. So when it comes to preferred stock, it can be either what we call cumulative or non-cumulative. As the name implies, cumulative, it adds up over time. Non-cumulative does not. Uh, so, so that's like a big difference when it comes to preferred stock. It might either be paid in a lump sum, meaning cumulative, or non-cumulative, paid incrementally. It's a way to think about it. So dividends and arrears must be paid before dividends may be paid on common stock. That's cumulative. Right? So the oldest stuff needs to be paid first. Cumulative. Accum accumulated and therefore must be paid before any of the new stuff gets paid. That's cumulative. Non-cumulative 
It's declared and then paid. Declared and then paid. That's it. Yeah, simple. Here are examples of both. On the left, we see the cumulative. See how it adds up and then it's paid. Adds up, then it's paid. Uh, all this stuff gets paid first. Right? Um, that's cumulative. Non-cumulative, it just gets paid as it rolls through. Very straightforward. You can see uh, in total they're the same. In total they're the same. There's 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 no there's no true effect here. It, it's just um, it's just really it depends on the company. One of the last things I think in this in this part is um, treasury stock. Now sometimes. A company might decide to buy back their own shares. We issued a hundred thousand shares of stock, but then we, the company says, you know what? I got to think about a way to raise the value of each share of stock. How do we do that? We take other shares out of the environment. If it's no longer available the value of what is out there goes up, you see? So uh, we call that treasury stock when a company repurchases its own shares of stock. We issued the shares, now we're gonna buy them back. And we might reissue those shares later on to employees as a form of compensation or to, um, you know, back onto the market. but. Usually, the reason why a company does that is because we're going to use those shares to buy up other companies or competitors. We're going to avoid a hostile takeover. So let me give you an example of this. A long time ago, uh, when Starbucks and Pete's Coffee were two different companies, they used to... Uh, buy and sell each share of stock from each other. Meaning, um, when Starbucks wanted to take over Pete's Coffee, the way that they did it was they purchased 20% of all of their available stock in the market. So Starbucks was the primary shareholder, the largest shareholder. In that case, that creates what we call a hostile takeover, where now Starbucks owns Pete's. You see, that, that's how that happens. The third one is to uh, give it back to the employees as a form of compensation, and the fourth is to maintain a strong market. In other words, raise the value of each share of stock or outstanding. Here's an example of the transaction. When a company decides to engage in treasury stock, we debit treasury stock 11,500, which is representative of the value of the stock per share and repurchasing each share. $11.50 per share times 1,000 is 11,500. So debit common treasury stock and we credit cash. Uh, yeah, same example. So. So, uh, when we sell shares of treasury stock, we debit cash and credit treasury stock. Very straightforward. If we sell treasury stock above our cost, that's of course in excess. So the difference gets credited. Here we have an example, 400 shares, $12 per share. We debit cash 4,800. We credit the treasury stock 4,600, 40, 400 shares times the 12. Now, obviously there's a difference of 200 here. The difference uh, is the in excess. So we take the issue on price, $12 minus the cost, $11.50 which was the amount that we paid for each share. 
That gives us a difference of 50 cents per share. 50 cents times 400 shares is 200. So that's how we get there. Selling the treasury stock below its cost. Sometimes that happens, uh, you know, because the share price goes up and down, right? If we bought the if we bought the shares eleven dollars fifty, then the stock price drops to eleven twenty, and we're going to resell it. We're we're selling it at a loss. So here we have the example. We sold five hundred shares at eleven dollars twenty cents per share. We debit cash five thousand six hundred. Okay, we uh, uh, but why that? Because the treasury stock. Uh, when we recorded it, was at, at the par value. The par value was $11.50 per share, 500 shares. Of course, it is $5,750. That gives us a difference or a loss in this case of $150. Another way to find out why $150, you take the issuing price, minus the cost price, which in this case would give you a negative 30 cents. That negative 30 cents times the, let me think about this, the negative 30 cents times the amount of shares, that'll give you the 150. So, uh, it's important to understand these changes through common stock, preferred stock, etc., because it, as I, and I mentioned this throughout the uh, throughout the presentation, is that we need to also report these, uh, and we report these in the statement of retained earnings. And as you know, the statement of retained earnings shows those changes: issuance of stock, repurchase of stock, um, also known as treasury stock. Um, you know, dividends paid, et cetera. All those changes get listed in the statement of retained earnings. Uh, we add it up to get the ending balance. That ending balance shows up on the balance sheet. Retained earnings is the amount that we keep within the company. That's what retained earnings means. It's the total cumulative amount reported net income less any losses or dividends declared. Fancy word of saying what's left over. What's left over is called retained. We're keeping it. We're retaining it in the company. Sometimes there's restrictions on saving and retained earnings like legal or contractual, and all those will be listed out in the notes. So in order for us to be able to calculate the statement of retained earnings, we take any type of prior balance plus or minus our changes. You know, uh, things like uh, issuance of common stock uh, or or whatever, all those type of changes, uh, plus net income, minus any cash dividends or anything paid out, gets us retained earnings balance. This is an example of of what uh, what. This would look like with all different types uh, of shares of stock. So we have the common stock paid in capital in excess, retained earnings, uh, treasury stock, etc. And then, so all of this to say, one of the things that we as as managers, business owners, etc., like to do is to calculate some real easy ratios to understand and analyze our earnings per share and, and things like that is is to calculate a couple of a couple of different ratios so so we're going to go over three of them today the first is called uh, earnings per share and the way we, we calculate that is we take our net income minus preferred dividends divided by the weighted average common shares outstanding now i had mentioned uh, that in accounting, the way to find your average is to take the beginning balance plus the ending balance divided by two. That's going to give you your, your average. Okay. So earnings per share is really important because uh, it helps us to figure out 
exactly what um, the value is of, of the company based off of its price per share uh, it, and how much it's earning it, are each year. Yeah. Earnings per share. Which brings us into the uh, price earnings ratio. This one's good because it tells us about the, the potential future growth of the company, you know, what it might look like uh, next year in terms of the company's value, you know, what the expected value is. And so a way for us to calculate that, we take the market value price per share, what it's worth today on the open market, divided by earnings per share. And the third one is called dividend yield. This is the annual amount of cash dividends that are expected to be distributed to common shareholders in relationship to this, the stock price of the, the company. So we take the annual cash dividends per, per year. You'll find that in the, um, on the, uh, on the saving and retained earnings, divided by the market value per share. So what the company's worth at, at the current time. That gives us dividend yield. And that, my friends, is the end of our discussion for uh, week 13. Um, I want to, again, just quickly go back into the classroom uh, and, and point a couple of things out. Uh, some of you, uh, thank you again to all of you who are on the call today. I, I really do appreciate that, especially since we are, we're doing this at a significant distance. Uh, as you know, I, I am currently in Medellin, Colombia, and I'll, I'll be here until the 25th. Um, so I appreciate you, you, you're taking the time to join me and I'm almost happy to actually get the time to do this today because I, I felt like it was important for me to be able to still be able to connect with all of you, uh, even though, you know, we're, we're dealing with this, um, interesting dynamic. So, so thank you. Uh, uh, so again, it just, it's really important when you look at the syllabus, you'll notice that, um, the discussion boards and the hypothesis combined are worth a, a hundred points out of a total of a thousand. So what that means is that if you decide you don't want to do the discussion boards or the hypothesis, the highest possible grade that you could earn in the class is a B. And that's if you absolutely ace the midterm, the final, and all of the quizzes. Okay, so so what that tells you is that the discussion boards and the hypothesis are also very equally important to complete. So uh, I know that some of you don't like doing them. I know, I get it, uh, but they're there. And so it's important that you do do them because, as you know, they're worth points. So um, they, they count toward your total grade. For this week, we have the, the discussion board week 13 discussion and we have the quiz related to to today's lecture um so those are your two action items you have to complete for this week are there any i'm going to stop sharing are there any questions comments concerns about anything at all are we doing okay i hope hopefully we're doing okay we're doing okay Yes, no, maybe. We're making it, Dr. B. We're making it. That's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. Yes, Joy, yes. Uh, so happy about this. <laughs> awesome. Thank Great. you. Well, I, no, I appreciate, I appreciate you, and I appreciate you, you all being here. It means a lot to me. And, uh, again, I was happy that I, I left campus uh, here early um to, in order to try to make it here on time to do this so I, i'm glad we were able to get it in so but thank you all so much for your time today again if you ever need anything uh you can send me an email uh you can message me through the classroom those are the best ways to get a hold of me at this time uh i would not recommend calling me uh or texting me because uh I, you know, you might be charged international if you do that, uh, depending on your 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 phone plan. Um, but the best way is just email or or message, um, and they'll they'll be good for now until I get back uh, to to the United States. Um, 
But again, thank you all so much for your time. I really appreciate all of you and your efforts and your hard work. So let's keep it up. Keep up the positive momentum. We only have a few weeks left. So let's knock this out of the park. You know, do the best to ace everything. Get all any past due work. Maybe if you haven't, get it in for sure. I'll continuously grade and all of that stuff. Now, I'm in the classroom every day. So, uh, you know, feel free to, uh, to message me if you need anything. So thank you again. Appreciate all of you. Have, have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. B. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good night. All right. Take care. Ciao, ciao.